Hello, community. Welcome back to another episode of the Dig Deep, the Mining Podcast. And we have another returning guest uh, who appeared recently back in July this year, which was episode 156. Um, James Sykes is the CEO and director of Baseload Energy, a fully funded uranium exploration company um, that has achieved uh, resounding success within the region, um, like holding a portfolio of highly prospective uranium exploration um, properties in the eastern side of the Athabasca Basin. Um, Jen, James brings over 10 years of experience in the Athabasca Basin, um, uranium exploration and discovery. Um, and we wanted to get James uh, back on the uh, podcast. Um, it, obviously, he was only on probably four or five months ago. And the reason is he, they've made a significant uh, discovery. So we wanted to get James back on the podcast to obviously hear more about that. So hi, James. How, how are things? Things are awesome, Rob. Very exciting times for Baseload. Thanks for having us back on the show. Yes, yeah, certainly. And look forward to, uh, to talking about that very shortly. Um, but those that are um, that didn't listen to your episode uh, three or four months ago, um, one of them just give us a quick overview, uh, background, background about yourself um, and about Baseload. Yep. Myself, I've been in the industry for the past 15 years, uh, focused on almost exclusively uranium exploration in northern Saskatchewan. I've been a part of a number of discoveries, including Hathor's Rough Rider discovery, which is now Rio Tinto. Uh, as Rio Tinto bought them out, I was one of the lead people behind Next Gen Energy's Aero Discovery. So a lot of people recognize my work for that. Uh, but also with Denison Mines in the early days uh, pre-discovery, I was part of the I was part of those teams that decided to go and and pick those targets that became discoveries. And now with Baseload Energy, we are a new exploration company. We listed last year, June uh, June of twenty twenty, and so we've. We've just uh, we've picked up three exciting projects in the Athabasca Basin area moving forward with a uh, new type of strategy for exploring for high grade uranium. And that's looking for these near surface high grade basement hosted deposits without uh, without sandstone or very little, very minimal sandstone, but looking at areas that are close to infrastructure. So we've just recently made a discovery, the what we call the Accio discovery, and it fits with our thesis. So it's Quite exciting times. That was our first first drill program as a company as well, and we've we've made a discovery. So very happy that we have you know, pro- returned and made true to our promise. Yeah, certainly. Right. So let's get straight into this, and that's and I obviously appreciate if you can tell the uh, tell the audience about this new uh, uranium discovery um, and what it really means for the company. Oh, Rob, it means a lot for the company. Absolutely, it's as it, Kind of distinguishes us as, um, like I said, as being true to our word. Um, you know, we I've always said from day one that we explore differently. We explore things uniquely, and um, I think that has shown. So we are we are definitely expanding on on what we do and what this discovery means for us is that we now have something that we can target on the uh, Athabasca 2.0 idea. Those near surface high grade uranium deposits, something that can be open pitable, but in a very, very small pit size, because these things can be concentrated and tiny. That's what we're after. And what we've seen at Accio, it has the signs for it. You know, what, what we've released in our press releases, there's definitely visible uranium mineralization. It's a huge, it's a huge plumbing system. And there's a lot going on for it. The Athabasca is renowned for high grades. Uh, we've seen very high radioactivity. We've seen visible uranium within the core. Uh, we'll all be, we're waiting for assays, and that should be the next two to four weeks. But uh, that will tell us if we're seeing high grade or not. Once you're on those high grade, uh, once you're once you're seeing high grades, then it's just it, it's it's a whole new system. It's it's something brand new, and it's a discovery that is close to infrastructure. So it's it means a lot for us because we do have this idea, the Athabasca 2.0, and we seem to be making this, well, putting this thesis to its tests and almost proving it true. Obviously the economics haven't come into play yet because this is, we're four holes in, but it, it, it's great. It, it, it's exactly what we're looking for. Yeah, and, uh, and obviously we were speaking just before, uh, before recording, and I know how passionate and excited that you are, that you are around this. Um, how does this compare to probably some of the other discoveries that you have made? 
it's quite similar and that's what that's why i am very excited i have you know working on on hathor's rough rider deposit uh, we had a lot of clay alteration and we had a you know we eventually found a few more discoveries as well along strike so it's it, it points to these large plumbing systems that can carry and, and deposit uranium in, in high concentrations so having that analogy plus other deposits i've seen around there are definitely a lot of comparisons i would say that the alteration that that we've seen in our in our drill holes so far is probably the largest alteration envelope i've seen very close to it and that's exciting because you need the fluids to to move uranium so size wise i think this has the makings for something that could be very big and that's yeah that's where we we definitely have to keep exploring this um, there's there's always the idea we're, we're looking at a 1500 meter trend it's a 1.5 kilometer trend on strike and it's about 400 to 450 meters wide uh, this large geo this geophysical anomaly that we're chasing and you consider that the world's largest high grade deposit in, in one concentration is macarthur rivers pod 2 its maximum dimensions are 100 meters by 80 meters by 60 meters at 20 percent u308 and that's 250 million pounds 100 meters now, I don't know how many people are familiar with, with exploration and mining, but a 250 million pound deposit within 100 meters uh, being the highest dimension of a volume, that's crazy. That is insanely small. And you can fit one of those within this, within this Accio target area that, we're, that, that we've just discovered. You can fit a number of them in there. That's the dream of what we are chasing. And it's seeing the right type of characteristics that are there that that have moved uranium through the system that's beautiful yeah no and i, and I can see it i can see it in 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 the way that you're um that you're speaking that you're really excited about this so um your news releases have expressed results as radioactivity in the form of counter counts per second um uh, not as uranium concentrations can you help us understand what those uh, radioactivity results mean? Yep. Yeah, and the reason why we did so is because we wanted to show people that we do have uranium, that we do have radioactivity. We had a, a, group, a, a company north of us had made an intersection uh, just the month before we did, and they expressed, they expressed their finding as CPS, as counts per second radioactivity. But then they had also... Uh, followed up pretty quickly with assay results so you can make a nice comparison that way so we figured that was a you know we could use that as a comparative tool now what you're doing with radioactivity though is you're you're scanning the drill core and with a scintillometer handheld scintillometer and pick, picking up the radioactivity on it now radioactivity are is mostly from three different elements uranium thorium and potassium the scintillometer that we use as a spectrometer on it. And, and it can tell you which is the right element or most concentrated. So everything that we have seen has come back as uranium. So we're happy about that. Uh, visibly, you know, I've seen the core, it's uranium. We just, we need the assays to come back to uh, give that 100% confirmation that it's all, that it's all there. So uh, typically in the Athabasca Basin, and again, what it's known for is high grade. What is high grade? High grade is uh, over 1% U308, probably even less than that high. The average global grade of uranium is 0.1% U308. So if you want to consider high grade, it could be 0.5% U308. So it's still, that's, we, can, we can go with that metric. It's whatever you almost want to call it. But the higher grade uranium, the more radioactivity. From my experience in the Athabasca Basin, 10,000 CPS, 10,000 counts per second is roughly equivalent to 0.1 or sorry, uh, to 1% U308. So that, that's high grade. Now, our best results that we've had, uh, we, we have seen 10 centimeters of over 10,000 counts per second. So if I use the term loosely, that would be high grade. But it's, it's still, it's just, it's, it's radioactivity. Now, a lot of the, a lot of the other, um, other results that we've put out there. Yes, it, it, it's all radioactivity telling us that there is uranium in these rocks. And that's as far as we can quantify as the company. That's why we need that third party, uh, third party lab 
neutral neutral party to disclose on what the radioactivity really really is okay. it's, a, it, it's a quick indication to show that yes this is you know this is something that has deposited uranium um how does this sort of um discovery compare to with uh with other athabasca deposits that you've seen oh very similar i think have you not asked that one already i did but it was more around the the the, um, the, the discoveries that you actually were involved in what about other discoveries in the in the region oh in the region itself yeah very similar it's that's i i think we're on I think this whole thing, because of its size and because of what we've seen in the core, there are indications that there are multiple structures, uh, sub-parallel structures and, and branching structures. So it's going to be a huge structural network. Uh, we've already seen plentiful indications for that. And what, uh, so where we are may not be on the juiciest spot. Uh, again, if we're looking for a MacArthur River, if we're looking for a pod two, that thing could be hidden anywhere along the structural network. But so what we have seen and how it compares to others is that we're we're distal but close if that makes any sense uh, you know, we're right within the we're right within uh, something that would have led to the griffin discovery so I, I like to use griffin as an analogy so griffin is a basement hosted deposit uh, denison mines has the griffin griffin deposit uh, six, it's over 60 million pounds over 1.5 percent u308 uh, uranium uh, average concentration, but it's about 700 meters deep below the surface. But the discovery hole that was made there was uh, 1980. The, the company beforehand, they drilled 7.7 .7 meters at uh, was 0.17% U308. The group to the north of us drilled five and a half meters at 0.12% U308. So very similar. Now, come 2014, uh, 34 years later, after the after the Griffin discovery hole, uh, Denison came back and said, "Okay, well, let's you know, there's uranium in these basement rocks. Let's follow it up." The alteration was amazing because I saw that core. You know, that was back in my my Griffin days, or my Denison days. Saw the core, uh, brought it to the group, and that's when we decided that Griffin looked like a nice target. But uh, yeah, Denison went back in 2014, drilled it, and they have discovered the Griffin deposit, 140 meters down dip of, of that 1980 drill hole. So similar grades for what, we're, what we are seeing in the same system, maybe we just have to drill deeper. And that's, that's where I keep alluding to that what we're seeing could be interpreted to be on the edge of something. It could be interpreted to be uh, you know, quite distal. We don't, we don't know. But it's the it could lead there. It's it's the right fire that we need to find that could lead to the main source. And if you find that main source, it could be huge. So using that using that uh, that Griffin analogy, over sixty million pounds. If you assume that where we're seeing our mineralization, which is between ninety and one hundred and thirty meters from surface, not seven hundred. Well, now you're changing the scope of mining. Now you're looking at something that's open pitable versus going underground. Now you're changing the whole cost dynamics and effectiveness of this whole operation. So that's where this, that's where the idea of Griffin becomes such a beautiful and interesting play to, to explore for and, and try to find. That's what, that's what we're hoping for Accio. Griffins, yeah. pod twos, we're there, we're close, we're so close. Um, and what's the, the importance of the Athabasca sandstone at Accio? The sandstone is basically the fluid carrier. If you if you consider, uh, there are multiple fluid carriers. Uh, you can get uranium coming from the basement rocks. You can get uranium coming from the sandstone. And uh, to a degree, you need those sandstone fluids to come into your, your structural network and deposit uranium it's all a chemical reaction lots of fun fluid dynamics and fluid physics involved oh great stuff <laughs> but <laughs> the the sandstone it, it also carries hematite so it's an oxidized it's an oxidized fluid system and that's what you need you need the oxidized fluid system to carry uranium to a place where where it will get deposited and we've got sandstone on top uh, above our mineralization not directly. It's there's still basement rocks between between our mineralization and, and the sandstone, 
But what that gives us is another target area to explore for. Because now we've been looking at basement hosted deposits. That's, you know, we don't want to hit the sandstone because typically it's bad, but we've got just a little bit of it. We've got 10 meters and 20 meters and it's within 50 meters of the surface. So that is something that can be mineable with the sandstone there. Typically your Athabasca deposits, they've all got lots of sandstone on top and they just can't be mined, not, not conventionally anyway. So we do have conventional style mining for the Athabasca. But again, it's that it's that unconformity style of mineralization that a lot of people search for. We, you know, we have that as an exploration target now. And that's these unconformity deposits is, are where you get larger deposits at higher concentrations, typically. So if we can find something uh, mineralization at the unconformity, it'll be higher. It should you know, theoretically be higher grade. There should be a lot of it. And because it would be 50 meters of the surface, now you're looking at probably the next, the best deposit that uh, that is on the face of the earth that could go forward for, for supplying nuclear energy. Now, after Cigar Lake, Cameco doesn't have anything really down the pipelines. What are they going to do? If you if we make a discovery like that, huh, you're gonna see you're gonna see this thing go within 10 years. So what what's the what are base loads exploration plans over the next sort of six to 12 months? We have a nine, uh, at least a $9 million commitment to exploration in 2022. And we will be kickstarting that hopefully in January, February. Uh, we've got logistical work to do for, for moving forward with, with our discovery. And that will be, you know, that will take between now and probably into January to, to get all that. And then we, then we will continue to explore Accio. Uh, two, we're looking for two drills, 10,000 meters within about two months, three months of drilling. And we should be able to achieve that. 10,000 meters, I think, would give us a nice, uh, nice idea of what we potentially have out there and could even get to an initial 43 101 resource if we're finding the right concentrations, the right thicknesses. And you just drill off those areas and, and start a resource calculation, prove that this thing has room to grow. Uh, so that, that's kind of what we want to get to. And we've got other projects or so shadow project and our catharsis project that we want to get to in the summer as well. We've kind of pushed all of the exploration plans on those projects off because of this new, new discovery. But then also we do want to continue exploration on the hook project because it's already proven that there's one discovery on it. So we do have a lot of other target areas that we'd like to follow up on and, and prove that there's more. You know, what's better than making a discovery? Making two discoveries. <laughs> what's better than making two? Making three. So that's that's kind of where I really want to go with this company. Just let's let's push the limits on it right now, especially while the market is hot. Let's really push this hard. Uh, so when I mentioned nine million in exploration commitments, I like to throw out this statistic as well. To, to make this discovery, it took us $1.5 million. That's from staking, that's from flying airborne geophysics, and that's to all of the, all of the drilling up to that discovery point. That was $1.5 million total expenditures. That has returned, that has turned into a 50 million market cap premium. So I think that is, I think that is exploration money well spent. We've done our shareholders complete justice and that's the type of company that, uh, that, that I like to say that we are, that we you know, put our best foot forward right from the get-go and really try to hit it hard, hit it fast and make off, uh, make off as the best thing out there. Just when our shareholders can, will appreciate us for us for that. Yeah. And um, just lastly, um, the spot uranium fund created a, a blip in the uranium uh, spot market um, throughout the first two weeks of September. Um, the, it sent the spot price up to um, fifty dollars a pound um, from about thirty. Um, what spot prices have re the spot price has recently receded back to thirty eight uh, pounds? Uh, sorry, dollars a pound uh, at the time of this recording. Um, what does that mean uh, for investors trying to understand the uranium market? Means a lot of things, actually, Rob. Uh, I guess you didn't know about yesterday, but uh, Spot had bought some more uranium on Monday, I think it was, and the Spot uranium price shot up almost eight dollars yesterday, or or it was eight dollars. They're they're at forty six dollars yesterday, so which is uh, ironic, it, yeah. So just a, uh, just a, a small move then in the in in a day, and that's how 
that's how the the fund can make that spot my spot uh, price change that that quickly um yep. and that sort of increase um yeah no it's exciting yeah it, it's a powder keg market i don't like using that term just because everyone associates powder kegs with explosions but that's the validity the volatility that you see in this market it just, it just moves so fast off so little that's to me, typically when I see that happen in companies, that's, uh, you know, you have low shares. So if you've got a low inventory, uh, maybe that's what's going on in the world, that it is that volatile, that the inventory is so low in the marketplace. Uh, what's what's going to happen? The, the market has to react. The market has to increase and production does have to come online. The only way to bring production back online is to increase the, increase the contract prices, which by term also increase the spot price. And so it's, I think it's going to have to happen. The uranium market is, is has to grow and it, it has to go up and all, all exploration development companies will benefit from that. Obviously the ones who can get into production in this next cycle will definitely, will definitely uh, benefit from all of that, which is why we are, you know, this is the whole Athabasca 2.0. This is what we're doing, why we're doing, because we wanted to get into this cyclone. This was the strategy that we saw could work the best. So hopefully fingers are crossed that it is working. But yeah, it's in, in if you go back to the last uranium cycle between 2005, 2007, it took the spot price to jump from $35 to $50, about 12 to 16 months. Sprott just did it with, with buying off the open market in two weeks. And then they just basically did it yesterday or earlier this week. So it's different situation this time, last time around, but with the same results, long-term thinking, uranium market, uranium prices have to go up, will, which will incentive, incentivize mining, but everybody benefits from the long run. Yeah. Um, and just lastly, just wanted me to tell us a little bit about your... Um... Your stock price. Uh, we obviously we just spoke briefly before uh, going live, but I wonder if you just tell us a little bit about your uh, your um, stock price. We've had some pretty exciting appreciation as of late. Yeah, when we when I did the first interview with you back in July, we were floating around forty five to sixty cents. Um, we had gone up and down. So when you when you look at our share price when when Sprout was buying, they well, our our share price went up to about 80 cents so inorganically we had just gone up since we put out the news release though we've gone from about 60 to closing at dollar uh, 27 yesterday so we've we've already had two times the return uh, and we even peaked at a dollar 51 uh, yesterday as well on off the news and this is all radioactivity news we haven't put out the assay results yet so it's you know it's definitely exciting to see that that people have an interest in the market but if you if you've got the right story and, and the right type of discovery behind you, then you can you know you can really capitalize on, on this. So every everything has just been absolutely well timed for us. That you know, we're, we're hitting our milestones as we plan them to be, and we are hitting all of our milestones. We went in for twenty five hundred meters diamond drilling, and we discovered within that. And that's I love how it all comes together. It's a great feeling. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, James, really appreciate your time and uh, coming back on the podcast and hopefully we get you on uh, during next year sometime when you've got some more more results to give us um, because it's exciting times for you. And obviously speaking off um, off air before, I know how, how um, passionate you are about obviously finding this discovery. Um, you do a lot of work with obviously within, within the Athabasca Basin um, and this is just another discovery that you've made and... Um, and I suppose it's a little bit more of your own discovery and your own own sort of company. So um, really appreciate your time. And those that are listening, um, great news for the company. Appreciate if you can obviously share and like this episode with other people within the industry um, and other maybe other investors in the uranium space, um, because it's obviously an exciting journey that James is on. Um, and it's good to get an update on on what has just uh, just happened with this new discovery. So appreciate if you can like, share and like this episode. If you're watching on the YouTube channel, appreciate if you can uh, like and share this episode. Uh, and those are listening on the podcast. Um, yeah, as you always do, appreciate you uh, supporting the channel 
and and sharing and telling your friends, family, other people within the industry about um, about the podcast and obviously especially about this episode as well because it's a exciting journey that James is on, like I said. So um, thank you for listening, and until next time, happy mining.